here's the disclaimer to this talk. One, there are a fair amount of you, and there's only one of me, and that makes my anxiety shoot through the roof. So I'm gonna pretend there's like four of you, and we're just having like a pleasant conversation. Are we cool with that? Um, two, everything I have to say today, I'm saying it for myself too. Uh, the more that I know in life, all that I really know is that I truly don't know anything. So any nugget of truth that you derive today isn't something I've totally figured out. I'm still learning, I'm still growing, and I don't think that's ever going to change. Three, I, I mentioned that I'm not a qualified biblical scholar, but um, the God I believe in gave us a living, breathing text that is accessible to all who read or hear it. So how's about we start with some scripture reading? Is that cool with you all? I'm going to be reading from the book of Romans, chapter 11, 33 through 12, 15, where this conference's theme verse comes from. And, and listen to me here. I'm guilty of this myself. Whenever I go to church, the scripture reading is where it's easiest for me to just zone out, right? Um, but I really assure you that what I'm about to read to you are the most profound words that I'll say today. So I really urge you to do your best to listen to what Paul is saying here. Oh, the depth of the riches of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable his judgment and his paths beyond searching out. Who has known the mind of the Lord or who has been his counselor? Who has ever given to God that God should repay them? For from him and through him and for him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the patterns of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. For by the grace given me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment. In accordance with the faith God has distributed to each of you, for each of us has one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same function, so in Christ we, though many, form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. We have different gifts according to the grace given to each of us, if your gift is prophesying, then prophesy in accordance with your faith. If it is serving, then serve. If it is teaching, then teach. If it is to encourage, then give encouragement. If it is giving, then give generously. If it is to lead, do it diligently. If it is to show mercy, do it cheerfully. Love must be sincere. Hate what is evil. Cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in love. Honor one another above yourselves. Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor, serving the Lord. Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. Share with the Lord's people who are in need. Practice hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Mourn with those who mourn. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be proud, but be willing to associate with people of low position. Do not be conceited. This week we're talking about Romans 12, 1 and 2, and the concept of letting the altars in our life reflect the supremacy of Christ and altering our lives accordingly. And this talk is titled, The Gift of Not Knowing It All, How Engaging in Critical Thought and Cultural Humility Frees Us to Fully Step Into Our Gifts. It's a pretty simple message that I'm trying to communicate to you all today, but please don't for a second confuse simple with easy. I never understood how pastors always manage to come up with three-point sermons, you know? Is there some pastoral pedagogy class that all of them take? Some pastor emeritus is up at the front of the lecture hall saying, in this class, you'll learn beyond the shadow of a doubt how to reduce your message to three simple steps. You get extra credit if they all start with the same letter. And then all of their wives take like a concurrent class at the same time that teaches them how to bake green bean casseroles. 
You know, I love the local church, I do, but too often it seems that some of the pastors I've experienced work really hard to not make their congregations think deeply about the world. I have a three-point sermon for you all today. And no, not all the points start with the same letter. I could only get two of them to fit, so I didn't get the extra credit. And I don't have a wife, so no one gets green bean casserole. Sorry, just go to Taco Bell and feel sorry for yourself like normal single people, all right? (laughs) It's easy, cheese are ready to crunch, come on. My three points, the importance of critical thinking, the importance of cultural humility, and how if we do those things well, we'll be more free to step into our gifts. Just a warning as we proceed though, I ditched that pedagogy class. I never learned how to make a congregation feel comfortable. So if something I say today makes you feel uncomfortable, I'm not sorry, I'm glad. Because we're not called to comfort. That's one of those things we sacrificed when we started following Jesus. In preparing for this talk, I worked with a few friends to get their feedback on it, and at first I didn't really have any transitions. It was all prosaic and flowy, which I loved, but as it turns out, not everyone likes it when you just ramble for 40 minutes. Um, They prefer to have some structure or whatever. So here's I'm going to transition from point to point. You ready? I'm going to tell you when I start talking about my next point by saying, so anyways, I'm going to start talking about my next point. Is that cool? (laughs) So anyways... I'm going to start talking about my next point. (laughs) Oh, the depth of the riches of wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable his judgments and his paths beyond searching out. Never be lacking in zeal. For from him and through him and for him are all things. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. You know, so often when we read this last verse, we think what Paul is talking about is purging our minds of sin. I just want to be transformed by the renewing of my mind. My mind is so worldly. And while that is a component of what Paul is talking about here, I don't think that it's the full picture. What I really believe Paul is talking about here is sanctification. Now, sanctification, to speak of it simply, is becoming more like Jesus, becoming more holy. And if our view of becoming more holy and more like Christ is limited to removing sin from our lives, then we have drastically missed the point. There are three reasons I can think that show this to be the case. One, we're called to continual, eternal, unending worship through engaging our sanctification, right? Right? And the process of sanctification doesn't end after the eschaton, right? We'll still be seeking to be more Christ-like in heaven. And whatever your theology of the afterlife may be, I think that many of us can agree that the world that is to come when heaven meets the earth will be one that is without sin. And if that's true, and your definition of sanctification is simply removing sin from your life, then your heavenly life is going to be pretty boring. Two, this shallow perspective of sanctification, one where that aim is limited to removing any sin from your life, is one that is rooted in shame. I'm not talking about guilt here, because guilt is feeling bad about something that you've done, right? But shame is feeling bad about who you are. You are a sinner. I am a sinner. We are all sinners. If we are ashamed of that, then we're rejecting the gift we have in Christ to cover us with his grace and call us saints. Shame should never be the motivator in our pursuit of sanctification. Three, Jesus was without sin, right? And if our sanctification is a pursuit of becoming more like Christ, which it is, and our only goal is to remove sin from our lives, something he never even had in his life, then we're doing a very bad job of becoming like Christ. This is Feels complex, so I don't want to lose you here, but but hear me out on this. Of course, Jesus was tempted in all the same ways we are. He was fully human, but he was also without sin. And God knew that we were never going to achieve that this side of heaven, right? All sinners fallen short of the glory of God. Paul said that earlier in Romans. That's why the whole substitutionary atonement thing had to happen. God had that covered already. He knew we'd sin and keep sinning, even when we so desperately try to stop. 
I mentioned earlier that I love the church, and I really do, I promise, but I'm also not the biggest fan of letting things that screw up the bride's beautifully broken believers continue. The church in all its human imperfection so often engages in many damaging practices. I'm gonna give you a shallow example before I give a deeper example to show what I mean. Uh, I'm gonna talk for a bit about the church in the United States, largely evangelical churches in the suburbs, and I recognize that this isn't everybody's experience, right? International folks, Orthodox folks, Catholic folks, but this is my experience, so that's what I'm gonna talk about. And, and I think that some of what I'm gonna say later on is translatable beyond just this creepy little subculture that all of us, some of us find ourselves in. A while back, a, a blogger named Rachel Held Evans, who write pro, writes prolifically about the evangelical church, started a Twitter conversation about the crazy things people experienced in their youth groups, and it blew up. The blog post is titled, It's a Miracle Any of Us Survived Youth Group, and it's hilarious. You should check it out. Here are a few examples of the things people said. Guy has eggs saran wrapped on his head, girl on shoulders holding dead fish trying to break all the other eggs. For real, I won. I remember having to eat an onion like an apple. I don't know why. The broom game, spin 30 times while staring at a broom, put it down, jump over it. Saw a kid break his front teeth. <laughs> Folks ate as many jalapeno peppers as they could, and the first person to vomit won. They fired the youth pastor a week later. Any CM majors, don't do that. Um, ultimate octopus, resembled ultimate frisbee, but with a giant frozen slimy octopus instead of a frisbee. We filled nylons with flour and beat each other with them. Now, these are fairly harmless, right? And they're hilarious, too, Ex except for that I'm pretty sure everyone who went to a Western non-denominational youth group in America's suburbia has a story of someone getting hurt by a really stupid game. But they're crazy. Have you ever stopped to think about how nuts these things are? But there are some other things churches do that are damaging in other ways. Equally crazy, but much more harmful in the long term. Raise your hand if you, in your church experience, were invited to be a part of, or were a part of, some kind of an accountability group, something like that. Now, don't get me wrong here. I was a part of groups like this growing up and in college, and, and some of my best friends that I still have are people from groups like this, but so often these groups felt less like a body of believers coming together to know more about the word and more about God and more like a group whose sole purpose was to maintain a scoreboard of all the things we had done wrong that week. By doing just this, not only did we miss out on that, which could have been a rich discussion about God and our relationship with him, but week after week of, I feel so terrible about this, I just want to be better, I don't know what's wrong with me, left me feeling less like a saint redeemed by the love of God and more like a person defeated by shame about my status as a sinner. No, becoming Christ-like is not only to purge your life of sin. And although that is something you should seek to do, it's not what I believe Paul is calling us to here when he says to be transformed by the renewing of your mind, at least not completely. So what else does Paul say about Christ and becoming more like him, right? Oh, the depth of the riches of the wisdom and knowledge of God. He is unsearchable. It's, it's interesting to me that Paul uses the word unsearchable here because most sane people, when they hear the word unsearchable, would say, okay, unsearchable, can't be searched, won't even try. But Paul also says in this passage to not conform to the patterns of this world. And the pattern of this world would say here, give up. No, as a matter of fact, don't even start. This is a mystery best left unexamined. But Paul also says that we should never be lacking in zeal. Now, zeal is a great energy or enthusiasm in pursuit of a cause or an objective. We are called to be zealous in our pursuit of God. Unsearchable is not a do not enter sign. It's an invitation. It's a dare from Paul to you. God is unsearchable, but you should seek to know him zealously. What are you going to do about it? How can we possibly know the unknowable? Of course, there's study of the word and prayer, but wouldn't a zealous pursuit of the unknowable use every possible avenue to discover that which cannot be discovered? Shortly after asserting that God is unsearchable, Paul reminds us that God is the creator of all things, right? For from him and through him and for him are all things. 
And I think that last statement gives us unique access to an often forgotten way to know God through his creation. If all things are from him and through him and for him, then can't we know more of him and who he is for and from and through those things? Critical thinking is, is defined by the American Association of Colleges and Universities as a habit of mind characterized by the comprehensive exploration of issues, ideas, artifacts, and events before accepting or formulating an opinion or conclusion. This is the crux of my first point. Engaging in critical thought is not a suggestion for Christ followers, it is a mandate. Only there's something markedly different about a Christian pursuit of critical thought. The definition that I read mentions a comprehensive exploration of something in order to formulate an opinion or conclusion, but we're told right from the get-go that there's no conclusion to be reached here. God is unsearchable, but there is so much depth to the riches of his knowledge and wisdom, and we are called to zealously engage in a comprehensive exploration of all facets of that. God created this earth that we might steward it well. To do that well, we must know it, research it, understand its patterns, name, and care for its animals. God created humans that we might be in relationship with one another. To do that, we must know each other, seek to understand one another, how we're the same, how we're different. From the dawn of creation, our stories have been powerful mechanisms for communicating truth. And these stories are what become great works of literature and film. The passion behind these stories is what becomes beautiful music and breathtaking art. Each academic discipline, business, science, philosophy, history, political science, education, psychology, and so on, is a part of the human story, the story of God's created beings. They are a part of God's creation. They are from him and through him and for him. Renew your minds zealously. Seek him in his creation. Leave no stone unturned, no page unread, no song unsung, no dance undanced. He is in and through and for all things. Seek him in all that you do. If we truly want to alter and renew our minds, wouldn't we use every tool God gave us to do that? The most beautiful thing about all of this, and, and this used to scare me to no end, but, but now I see it as kind of exciting, is this pursuit will never end. The part of sanctification where we seek to become more like Christ through the renewing of our minds, using the capacity he gave us to think critically about his creation, will follow us into eternity. You're being called to step into that journey now. So anyways... I'm going to start talking about my next point. <laughs> Do not be conceited. Do not think of yourself more highly than you ought. Do not be proud. Bless those who persecute you. Who has known the mind of the Lord? Honor one another above yourselves. Do you remember earlier when I told you that everything I'm going to say today, I need to hear too? This is especially true for me here. Pride. It's an interesting word, and, and I love words because they're all inherently neutral, right? Words are simply mutually agreed upon signs that point to experientially agreed upon symbols, and sometimes pride is experienced positively. I'm so proud of you is something my parents never said to me. Just kidding. School pride. <laughs> Eagle pride. Ka -ka, right? Pride rock, right? Pride can be a good thing. You should feel proud of your accomplishments. You should be proud of those whom you love when they succeed. You should take pride in your school. You should return to Pride Rock and avenge your father's murder. So how can something that's good also be bad? Hubris. Arguably the most utilized form of driving conflict in any narrative throughout history. It's a painfully relatable thing, this shadow side of pride. Like Icarus, we all know the feeling of flying too high and too hot. You know, one funny thing about pride is that a lot of the time when you're being prideful, you're deeply aware of it, right? I have an identical twin brother, and uh, being a twin is fun. You get all these ridiculous questions like, were you born on the same day? <laughs> 
can you read each other's minds? But this is my personal favorite. Do you ever fight? Of course we fight. I'm better at fighting with my brother than maybe anyone else in the world, even as adults, especially as adults. But uh, growing up, Luke, my brother and I, we would play video games a lot. And the only thing about this is he was and still is infinitely better than me at video games. The joke's on him, though, because I got my master's degree first. Not that I'm prideful or anything. <laughs> Anyways, there's this one game that we played, Soul Calibur 2, that Luke was literally unbeatable at. He would crush me whenever he played. It's an arcade-style game, sort of like Mortal Kombat, and there's this version of versus battle where you could line up eight characters and fight through each other's selections until all eight of one of the teams had been destroyed. And I could usually manage to do okay, you know, getting through three or four of his characters until I inevitably lost. But there was this one battle where he was on fire, and I was so very not. He annihilated all eight of my characters with only his first. And, and I think it was even worse than that. Half the battles were perfect on his end. I didn't even lay one blow. I was furious, fuming, livid. My heart was in my chest. My teeth were clenched. Anger was seeping out of every pore. So what did I do? I mean, it's a video game, right? I, I shouldn't really care. He always beat me, so this shouldn't matter, right? Wrong. Pride welled up in me in the form of what I believed to be a righteous anger. I was good at video games. I'm not the kind of person who lost this badly. This isn't how it was supposed to be. So what did I do? Well, naturally, I wrestled him to the ground, forcefully took off his shoes, stormed out of the house, and threw them over the back fence into the Mormon church parking lot behind our house. <laughs> Justice. Retribution, only as I walked victoriously from the backyard, I knew the whole time that justice wasn't served in the way I wanted it to be. Let it be known that justice did win out in the end, but it looked less like Luke realizing his great heir and defeating me the moment he saw his beloved footwear clear the rose bushes, and more like my not so subtle humiliation. Upon my return, I, I wasn't met with a defeated brother, I was met with laughter. The whole time I knew I was being prideful. The whole time I knew I would have to return to face the reality of the foolishness of my actions. Eventually, I would have to swallow my pride. And pride is a really bitter and hard thing to get down. But we feel so justified in our actions. It feels so good to just beat our chests and feign strength because we don't want to show the world that our pride is just an outward display of insecurities derived from our weakness, right? Don't show the world where you're weak. We are supposed to be strong. The antidote to, to this kind of pride, the bad kind of pride in which we willingly and knowingly partake, is remembering that we are made perfect in our weakness. We might think that the world wants to see where we're strong, but sometimes what the world needs to see is where we are weak. But showing the world where, you're weak, where you are weak requires that you also know where you're weak, right? It requires self-awareness. The second point of my talk is cultural humility, and while it may seem counterintuitive, the first step towards adopting a lens of cultural humility is a commitment to reflection and self-evaluation. Psychologists define cultural humility as an ability to maintain an interpersonal stance that is others-oriented or open to the other in relation to aspects of cultural identities that are most important to that person. In other words, cultural humility is an ability to press pause on our stories to leave space for the stories of others. Now, in order to step into a perspective where you can be others-oriented, you must necessarily be able to know those aspects of your own cultural identity that are most important to you. You can't press pause on something that you don't know even exists. This includes being aware of when you are weak and how your weakness can help others to see your truth and this truth of your story more clearly. The other funny thing about pride is, is that sometimes we can also be deeply unaware of it. For 200 years during the Crusades, the church sanctioned the pillaging of countless Muslims in the name of church reunification. 
For a hundred years during the Spanish Inquisition, the church ordered the torture and execution of hundreds of thousands of Jews and Muslims in the name and pursuit of conversion. The Salem witch trials executing innocent women because of puritanical fear-mongering. It's no great secret that many advocates for slavery in the States were Christians using scripture to assert that reducing an entire continent to slavery is a religious mandate. Even when slavery was abolished, we didn't learn our lesson because proponents of segregation, Jim Crow, separate but equal, used the same scriptural arguments to reduce a race of people to three-fifths of a vote. Lynchings were not hateful, they were just. These acts were not sin, they were our call, it was our religious mandate, our right. These people weren't trying to do harm, they were trying to do good. But I'm glad that that's all history. I'm glad we only read about that in textbooks and that this generation of evangelicals is more aware. We don't give our blind pride a foothold, allowing it to fester and form into a destructive self-righteousness that leaves fellow image bearers bloodied and battered. Do we? We just want to love without condoning. We're not prideful. We're just convicted. We want to love that Muslim family that, that lives in our subdivision, but how do we do that while still being sure they know our God is real and theirs is not? We want to love our friend from home who comes out as gay, but we want to be sure they know that we think what they're doing is sinful while we love them. We want to love that pastor that has an affair, but he certainly can't be a pastor anymore, right? I mean, he sinned. I like to think that I know love when I see it, but, but sometimes I have a really hard time seeing actions like this as loving. Sometimes when I do things like this, it feels a little bit more like pride. So what is the antidote to a pride we cannot see? <clears throat> This is one of those things that I don't fully know the answer to. This isn't easy for me to resolve. In fact, I don't think it's something I will ever do perfectly. But, but maybe the antidote to something we cannot see is equipping ourselves with its foil, right? With its opposite. If blind pride gives way to self-righteousness, then adopting a lens of cultural humility might be what helps us become more aware of when our desire to love well actually does more harm than good. Listen to me here. I am not talking about giving way to evil or sin, right? Hate what is evil. Cling to what is good. But sometimes I think the evil Paul is talking about here isn't the sins of others, but it is our inability to find grace for the sins of others. If Jesus can hang on the cross and say, forgive them, for they don't know what they do, then shouldn't we be able to shut up for two seconds and hear how this Muslim family felt so afraid after 9-11 that they would be interned like the Japanese after Pearl Harbor? Shouldn't we be able to withhold whatever righteousness we want to share while this gay person tells us that they were forced into homelessness in high school because their parents went to a church that said they should give their child over to the devil if they claim a gay identity. Shouldn't we be able to listen to the pain that is likely so real in the life of a person who felt so isolated in their leadership that they were unable to disclose a sexual addiction to anyone for fear of excommunication? What I'm talking about is postponing judgment, postponing our own perspective, even if just for a moment, to give way to love. Some people may be up in arms about me saying this, right? Evil is evil, sin is sin. That may be true, but, but, and thank God for this, I am not the ultimate arbiter of what is or isn't evil or sinful. What I am called to, though, beyond a shadow of a doubt, is grace. Brennan Manning, in his memoir, says this, this vulgar grace is indiscriminate compassion. 
It works without asking anything of us. It's not cheap, it's free. And as such, will always be a banana peel for the orthodox foot and a fairy tale for the grown-up sensibility. Grace is sufficient even though we huff and puff with all our might to try to find something or someone it cannot cover. Grace is enough. He is enough. Jesus is enough. So anyways, I'm going to start talking about my next point. <laughs> We've talked about the mandate set before us to engage in, in critical thought and, and to develop cultural humility, but, but to what end? What is the point? Why are we doing this? Paul says this, then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. And a little further on, for each of us has one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same function. So in Christ we, though many, form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. We have different gifts according to the grace given to each of us. Don't get mad at me here, but my final point today is not to tell you what your giftings are. And it's not because I'm mean or don't want to, but it's because I genuinely don't know. I'm still looking for myself. But I think that through the renewal of your mind with critical thought and through the reduction of your pride through cultural humility, you'll be better able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. I don't know all of you. I don't know what your specific giftings are, but I can tell you how God wants you to use your giftings. In Romans 13, Paul says this, let no debt remain outstanding except the continuing debt to love one another. For whoever loves others has fulfilled the law, the commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not covet, and whatever other the command there may be are summed up in this one command. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no harm to a neighbor, therefore love is the fulfillment of the law. I don't know God's specific call in your life. I don't know his will, and I don't know how he has gifted you, but I do know that he has given you the greatest gift, the greatest call, the gift of love. So often we want to know exactly what God's will is. Just tell me what I need to know. Tell me what to do and I'll do it, right? That's what we want. We just want to know how we are gifted, how to use our gifts, and what God's will is. But sometimes all we need to know is that we don't know. We don't know the depth of the riches and wisdom of knowledge of God, so we have to learn. We don't know the experiences and stories of other people, so we're required to listen. We don't know what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. So all that we can do in the meantime is to live out his greatest commandment, to love. Here at Biola, we put great worth in courage and conviction, which is a good thing. But sometimes I get confused about what it means to live with courage and conviction. The purpose of our courage and our conviction should always be to love. Maybe a loving way to have courage is to withhold our convictions for a moment and listen. Maybe the loving way to be convicted is to perpetually examine creation in the pursuit of the truth of the great mystery. God gave us hearts full of courage. He gave us brains with great capacity to learn and to grow. God gave us each giftings and callings, and he gave us all the gift and the call, the fulfillment of the law of love. What would the church look like if we stepped into that gift a little more? Thank you. Biola University offers a variety of biblically-centered degree programs, ranging from business to ministry to the arts and sciences. Visit biola.edu to find out how Biola could make a difference in your life.